All right, home stretch. We are almost to networking and booze, so getting there. Uh, but first, our closing keynote speaker for this afternoon. It gives me great pleasure to introduce William McDonough, who, in my opinion, really needs no introduction. But for the one to two of you in this room who might not know who Bill is, he is a globally recognized and respected architect, designer, author, and sustainable growth pioneer. He works with companies and countries at all scales through his enterprises McDonough Innovation, MBDC, and William McDonough and Partners. It is through these companies and collaborations that the Cradle to Cradle Certified Program that many of you are familiar with that was established by Bill as a leading product certification system, allowing products to have endless resourcefulness and a business strategy for sustainable growth. So Bill's vision for a world of abundance, where the very concept of waste has been eliminated, has been the major theme of his influential works. Bill currently serves as the chair of the World Economic Forum's Meta Council on the Circular Economy, is a contributor to The Guardian, and is featured in a unique series entitled The McDonough Conversations with Green Biz Chairman Joel McCower. So with that, please join me in welcoming Bill to the stage. Hi, everybody. It's so great. After, this feels like a, one of these 30-year overnight successes, isn't it? It's a marvelous thing. And I think there's history being made, and that really excites me. And when we look at the people involved, look at Dame Ellen, and think about design as the first signal of intention, but also think about leadership. Who is the leader on a ship? Well, it's the designer of the ship. Because if you didn't design it to be seaworthy, you're going down, especially if you're going to go out and test yourself like she did. So design the ship and do it well, because you're going to have to sail it in some pretty rough seas. Um, I'm also fascinated by the notion of circular economy coming, because in 2002, we, we published Cradle to Cradle in China with the subtitle, The Design of the Circular Economy. And this is because it's such an important idea that we focus on the economy. But it's also interesting to watch it replace, you probably noticed that, the term sustainability. And I'm sort of happy in one way to see this, even though it's just the economy still. Um, I had the privilege of, of being the only individual to win the Presidential Award for Sustainable Development 20 years ago. It's been a while here at the White House. And the press came up. and. And the reporter said, oh, Mr. Sustainable, what does it all mean? And I felt like Mr. Natural from Berkeley. And I was <laughs> trying to figure it out. And I looked at him, and I said, well, you know, I'm not that interested in the term sustainability, actually. And he said, what are you talking about? And I said, well, if I asked you what your relationship to your loved ones was, and you said, sustainable. <sighs> the other thing I noticed about sustainability, and Tim Lindsay, who we just heard from Caterpillar, had one of the greatest remarks I've ever heard, which was in this business. He said, oh, last year, $2 billion, I think it was, Tim, was it, recorded in sustainability consulting. And I went, oh, wow, $2 billion, big industry. And he said, yeah, and isn't it interesting? Well, I went to the scorekeepers. This was the people recording how people were doing. This is like going to a football game and watching the scoreboard. There are people in the field of play running around, banging into things, falling down, doing the work, and those are the people in this room. And so I just want to tip my hat to everybody here and um, just for fun. And I also want to note that in our book, The Upcycle, which talks about getting everything better, there's a mysterious corporate executive in the opening chapter, and he is sitting right over there. Um, so, have some fun. Now, cradle to cradle and design for the innovation and designing innovation for the circular economy. I want to show these two because it's a great privilege that the Ellen MacArthur Foundation has adopted cradle to cradle as the fundamental fulcrum and platform for this. But just let's take a look at what it means to think the way we are. Essentially, let's think about the economy. What do you need to be a growing company? What do you need to be a living company? To be a living thing, Francis Crick said, you need to have growth. 
You need to have income in order to have growth, and you need to have an open system of chemicals operating for the benefit of the organisms and their reproduction. That's what you need to be a living thing. So if we imagine that we have E equals mc squared, and then we realize that E, in a poetic sense, is coming from the sun. We have probably 10,000 times more than we need to run our systems, as Elon Musk just pointed out the other day. And then we have mass, E, M, and, and mass is the, uh, the material on the earth, the chemistry. But when you put these together, you get something quite astonishing. If you just look at E equals MC squared, you can have immense destruction. As a child, I was born in Japan, and I was always curious. what was why would people blow each other off the face of the earth? What was the city that disappeared in seconds? And then how would you do that? When I got to college, I looked into nuclear physics and discovered that E equals MC squared explained this. And I said, let's solve that equation. What does it mean? How many of you have solved E equals MC squared mathematically? Anybody? Huh. You want to? Let's be quick. You can go home and tell your kids you did it. All right, where's the number? C. What is it? Speed of light. Bigger than my head can hold, so it's almost infinity. Fine. It's not big enough for you. Square it. Fine. So almost infinity squared, which means that if m is in any way a positive number, as in one hydrogen atom, then e is almost infinite. Goodbye, Hiroshima. That is the atom bomb. And if we wonder why we're afraid of certain things, it's because tools can be used for good or for bad. A hammer doesn't know if it's good or bad. The hammer's a hammer. It doesn't know if it's good or bad. The value of a tool is placed there by the intention of the human who is using it. If I hit you in the face, it's a weapon. If I use it to destroy a city, it's a bomb. But if we think about it, E equals MC squared tells us we have energy and we have mass. And the mass is precious because we don't have mass income. Occasional meteorite, some cosmic dust. That's about it. But you put the two together and what do you get? You get biology. You get us. And you get soil building. And this is the income. Carbon, nitrogen from the atmosphere, and solar energy. So let's run a system that works like that. So Michael and Braugart and I got together and decided there were two forms of nutrition. The one Crick is identifying, the biological one. But now we have technical nutrition. We have computers, we have televisions. But you don't want to own, as we've heard, there are examples from Cradle to Cradle where the washing machine, the television, and so on. You want to watch TV, you don't want to own lots of chemicals. And so we have things that go back to soil and things that go back to industry forever. And this causes us to create new business models, which is exciting. So we say, let's look at our material health, in many cases, down to the parts per billion. Let's look at material realization with new business models, the leasing concept or products and services, we called them 25 years ago. Clean energy, clean water, social fairness. So these dimensions are quite rich and very critical to us all. And so when, when the Ellen MacArthur Foundation brought this into the circular economy, it's quite beautiful because there's the diagram of cradle to cradle biological technical nutrient flows. And so we're, we're really delighted at that. Now I get to work with the waste industry. This is a map of waste in the United States. On the top are technical materials and the bottom are biological materials. And so we do lots of planning at a very large scale, trying to understand what does it mean to design packaging and products into these flows so that we can start to put this into that circular economy at various scales. Now, after the Earth Summit, we have eco-efficiency. What is that? Well, you know, uh, waste less. But eco-efficiency, which is so important, as we've heard, reducing what we don't want and reducing cost and risk and so on is good thing to do, but is it being good? What if you're doing something dangerous and you're just doing less of it? See? What if you're doing something bad and you're doing less of it? Well, you're less bad, but is being less bad being good? See, less and bad is not two not negatives multiplying into a positive, because less is a relationship and bad is a human value. You're just bad, just less so. So what does that mean? Now, Peter Drucker pointed out in a book in 1984, The Effective Executive, he said on page one, it's a manager's job to be efficient and do something the right way, but it's the executive's job to be effective and do the right thing. Then we do it the right way. Because what if you're doing the wrong thing? And what if you're doing it with Six Sigma perfection? Oh, now you're perfectly wrong. <laughs> what a strange and amazing moment for us to start to twist as the people we've heard from. Look at the beautiful things that are going on and have been going on in this room. 
quite amazing. People want packaging that does this because they want something good out of it. See, that's what is this about? So, being less bad is not being good, but that doesn't mean we don't want to do it. It's just that I want to change today. I want to sort of mention some of the language I've heard. We take the language of life cycle, end of life, when we talk about these things, kind of out of it. And here's why. See this thing? It's talking to you. Is it alive? No, sorry. It's not a living thing. So end of life, it was never alive. So we say end of use. Now watch what happens when you design for next use. See, all of a sudden, you're not going end of life and then projecting cradle to grave or cradle to crematorium, you know? And it's like you've got to go through some Hindu ritual or something to become reincarnated. No, this is designed for next use. You're designing the next use into the one that's here now. That's fascinating, and it becomes a design agenda, really important. And then instead of just saying minimize, avoid, reduce, well, oh, it's negative language, we say next use period and optimize, recycle, regenerate, and so on. So it becomes a positive thing, and it does get people excited. So we put it in the public domain, um, peer-reviewed uh, in an institute in California and Netherlands right now. And Stacy Glass is here from the buildings program. It's now in lead program for buildings as the gold standard. Thank you very much. So. What we're looking at, and Ellen alluded to this, because we talk about going to zero is, is okay if you're scared. Now, zero accidents, of course, this comes from you know, very serious uh, industrial hygiene protocols. But going to zero, if your goal is nothing, then let's just get up and leave the room. And we're not here. It's a really quick way to reduce our footprint, right? Going nowhere. Oh, let's go faster. So if you just say, let's reduce our carbon by 2020, by 20 percent, well then you're telling me what you're not going to do. I'm an executive, I have people working for me. They don't just come in and say, here Bill, I'm not going to do this. And if it's an ethical question, I'm glad to hear it. But think about that. This would be like me running out of here tonight and jumping in a taxi and saying, quick, I'm not going to the airport. How are we doing? So, the question of nothing is like, if you go home and tell your kids, I'm, my goal in the world is a zero, and you're damaging my ability to do that because I have to feed you now. Is this what we're doing? Right. So the idea of being less bad is good, actually, but let's put it where it belongs in the human value category. Is let's not do that anymore. And that's what Len was talking about. When you drive waste out of the system, you're getting rid of what you don't want. Fine. Right? So you're honoring the fact it's not what you want. Good. And then we call it the upcycle. And this is where we put in what we do want. So we want to go renewable power. We want to have less carbon in the atmosphere. You see, a toxin is a material in the wrong place. Lead is not a toxin. Lead is a heavy metal. Lead in here is solder. Lead in a child's brain is a neurotoxin. So if I can design things where these materials are going in technical cycles and never see the biosphere, they are tools. See. The minute it's in the biosphere, that's a toxin. Carbon, how many people think lead is a bad? Right? How many think carbon is a bad? Oh, well, if you don't like carbon, shoot yourself, dry up, and blow away, because you're mostly carbon. So what are you supposed to do about this? Carbon in the atmosphere is a toxin at this point in history. See, nature wants the carbon to come from the atmosphere into soil, and here we are. The oil and soil are only separated by the letter S. Back into the atmosphere, oops. So, keep the carbon solid. Keep it earthbound. Right? That's why I love plastics. Earthbound. Don't burn them, whatever you do. See? Don't burn them. No more carbon in the atmosphere. Fine. All right. So, we take these and we use these charts for continuous improvement. The first thing we do is look at your products and your, your, your supply chains, and we study what's in the products, and we assess them as an inventory, and then we filter them through intellectual filters. No more toxification of human mother's milk, for example. Anybody have a problem with this? And then we identify what we don't want, what we do want, so we want to get rid of the carbon energy, we want to increase the renewables and clean energy, so on. And you use it to do really good business. It's really fun, and you can make lots of money at it, and that's why you go to the circular economy, because you get to make a lot of money. Now, I, I was asked to define circular economy. For us, and I, I would like to say, circular economy is a resourceful economic system and innovation engine. It's an innovation engine, remember that. Providing benefits to society, not less liabilities to society, benefits. 
consider the present and the future. It is designed, cradle to cradle, to endlessly recirculate clean biological and technical nutrients, energy, water, and human ingenuity. Let's not forget that. The most powerful resource in this room is you. You know, everything you talk about, everything you touch, that Internet of Things is you manipulating all of this and intending for things to happen. And so, to put it in one sentence, the circular economy puts the re back into resources. Now, what does this let us do? Instead of the take, make, waste linear model that we've talked about all these years, we can take, remake, and restore the world. We can do this because we take the materials and we do things with them over and over again. I call this either or. Now, when you look at this, uh, a friend of ours, Michael Krasinski, a chemist, pointed out that if you mine gold ore from the, mine it from the earth, I guess DSM is no longer in the business of the mining, um, you know, it's interesting because there's a lot, I guess, Tim, is that your stuff there? That's your stuff there. Okay, if we use that and we dig up ore, we can get gold at about $210 a ton. If we mined old cell phones, circuit boards, we're getting about $7,500 of gold per ton, and we're also getting another, ready? Hold on to this, $20,000 worth of rare earths. Imagine that, $27,000 a ton on old circuit boards. Now, if we start to look at what it means to use these, these kinds of thoughts as our, our design, I want to go beyond just the economy, because in sustainable development, you know, we've had social fairness, equity, we've had capital, and, and market economy, and then we brought in the environment with sustainable development, but we want to get all of these together all the time. So let's run around really quickly. It's a fractal. So the economy corner, the economy corner is for NGOs that are for profit. See? We have GOs and NGOs. Most of the people in this room are NGOs. You just, some of you are for profit, and some of you are not for profit. It doesn't mean all can't be emissions, right? Just how you finance yourself. So a business must make a profit or it's not a business. It's gone. So by definition, do that. But then we have to ask ourselves, are people earning a living wage? That's economy corner, but fairness. And then we could look at fairness economy. Is it, are men and women being paid the same for the same work? Then we look at equity, equity. Are people being treated with respect, pure respect? Nothing to do with environment, nothing to do with money. Then is it fair for people to be exposed to toxins in the workplace or, in the, or the environment? See. And then, is it fair to leave rivers polluted or atmospheres damaged and so on for people, for future generations? That's environment, is it fair? Here's just purely environment, environment. Are you following the laws of nature? Now, as you may have heard, I am an architect. I promise you, I have no choice but to follow the law of gravity. It is not just a good idea. It's the law, okay? So, what else is there that nature is telling us that it's a good idea or we're going to get in trouble? So when we look at environment and economy, we realize we can ask the question, are we doing business while following the laws of nature? I find that very interesting, and that's part of the conversation we've had here. But when you look at this economy environment, this is being eco-efficient. Now remember, let's exaggerate for effect. If you're damaging the place with water and energy, and then you tell me I've reduced my water and energy consumption by 10%, isn't that great? That's nice, but if it's $10 million, they could ask the question to your managers, are you trying to tell me that last year you threw $10 million away you didn't need to spend on energy and water, and now you're only doing 90% of what you did last year? That's not eco anything. That's just bad management. You were throwing away $10 million. Yeah? So, okay, fine. But I just want to point out, just for the fun of it, I, they asked me to be pokey. Let's be pokey. So, triple bottom line, is it bottom feeding? Huh? So, if we think about that, that Drucker statement, this is a management efficiency. It's a very important thing to do. It's obviously very worthwhile on a million fronts. And you minimize risk of finance, uh, financial risk, social risk, environmental risk, and so on, supply chain risk. So it's important to do. But it's just the economy, triple bottom line. So you leave a little bit for efficiency, you leave your money, you leave a little bit, uh, you take corporate social responsibility, corporate social responsibility. It's just in the economy corner. What you're doing in this room, you are executives here, I can see. So you're triple top line, and we heard that. Remember what Len said and what, what Tim said? We're talking about generating revenue, right? That's what we're here for, right? And we heard that uh, uh, you know, from Dell, too, is we're here to generate revenue, good. So, generate revenue, now optimize growth. 
make it grow. Make the world better because you're here. I'm designing a building in Barcelona. It's, the lobby is butterflies hatching between two sheets of glass in the walls, two feet. And so you go to work every day and watch the ancient butterflies of Barcelona that are going extinct hatching in the walls. And on the weekends, the children come and release them into Barcelona and they go pester the parks department. Okay? Why can't a building restore biodiversity? Why can't a building restore butterflies? Why not? So think that way. So in 1995, I had my first chance to do a product for Steelcase, the largest furniture maker, and it was a fabric. I just want to point out, this is a black river in Indonesia. But before, you know, this was regulated by the Swiss. They couldn't bury a bird in this trimmings, had to ship them to Spain. And after we finished, and Michael Braungart and his chemists and everybody did our work, we reduced the, the chemicals to 38. We did a product so clean that the water coming out was drinking water, and the trimming became mulch for the local garden club, and the costs went down by 20%. So, save money, have strawberries. Hatch some butterflies. In the carpet industry, we work with Warren Buffett. And Shaw was number five in the industry way back when. And we started working on how to redesign it because there was 1.4 billion pounds of carpet waste in America every year. What if that was designed to be recovered and reused so we converted away from PVC, which is something we considered quite seriously suboptimal, certainly in a fire, et cetera, and we designed with caprolactam thermoplastic polyolefins and, and designed it and put an 800 number on the carpet. And so all of a sudden you're storing your, your raw materials on the customer's floors and your relationship to them becomes quite interesting because when they want to change it, you're the first person there and it's to your benefit because you're picking up your raw materials. What if the United States had a billion and a half pounds of carpet circulating through the country and that's our material stock? And then you get to it. It gets very exciting when you start to see these products as a service model. With Herman Miller and Steelcase, for the last 20 years, we've been designing for disassembly. These chairs come apart. This is not closed loop. See, these chairs are not going to go from Mexico City back to Grand Rapids. But the aluminum, the polycarbonate, the polyolefins, etc., all are going back to their, their constituents. Now, as we look at the packaging today, which we are very closely, I'm designing packaging with some of the biggest companies around, um, what we're looking at is that these plastics are not recyclable. Can you imagine that? Every one, 25 award winners, not one recyclable according to waste management. Not one. Do you know what they call those in the MRFs? They call them contaminants. They're called contaminants. Now companies like Dow, are you still here? Dow still here? Dow, hey, um, is working on some new polymers that are perfectly recyclable for these applications. And it's great because people are moving into the space and re realizing there's problems here to solve. And, it's, and they've been incredibly supportive in this. Now why does this matter for everybody? Well, we thought serving, quote, the bottom of the pyramid with sachets and so on would be kind of interesting, but my goodness, look, this is what we get. And a couple of weeks ago, I don't know if you saw this in Science Magazine, but here it is. Um, this is the plastic in the oceans, the first big study we've seen. And look where it comes from. China, Indonesia, Philippines, Vietnam, Sri Lanka, Thailand, Egypt, Malaysia, Nigeria, Bangladesh, South Africa, India, Algeria, Turkey, Pakistan, Brazil, Burma, Morocco, North Korea, and then we made it on the list, U.S. We're 20, but look at this, really. Is this our plan? Is this the plan? And if we look at the history of environmental legislation in the United States, look at this. This is over the last 150 years, environmental regulations in America. And you want to pull out the chemical pollutants, there they are. Wow. So, what is this? This is the difference between the guardian and commerce. Jane Jacobs said, the human sy syndrome of survival is creating the guardian and commerce. The guardian is the state. It reserves the right to kill. It is here to keep us safe. Okay? It will go to war. It will, it will take care of criminals. It, it's here to keep us safe. And commerce is meant to keep us free. Okay? If you look at even the history of rights, we've got I come here from Charlottesville, Virginia. I've had the privilege of living in a house designed by Thomas Jefferson. When you live in a house designed by Jefferson, you, you have to think about, oh, we have revolutions here. Sure. We have a tradition of revolution. What? Think about it. So all of a sudden, you realize that natural rights became human rights. And in human rights in the 1700s, American Revolution, French Revolution, human rights. This is the destruction of primogenitor, feudalism, and divine right. Anybody want to go back to being a serf? 
here? Okay. So then we look at the next century and we get Adam Smith and we get the market, right? Wealth of Nations, 1776 uh, uh, as well. And we have the market economy and we have the response, communism, capitalism, whatever, to that. But then in the 1900s, what do we get? We get the pollution century. So I think the next century, as the Chinese are realizing, must be the ecological century. Because we have equity, we have economy, uh, 100 years, whoops. What's the next one? Go. It's what you are doing. You are defining the next century. Stop and think about this. Design right now for a 10-year-old child, and guess what? You're designing for someone who will be alive, very likely, in the next century. How are we doing? We are Thomas Jefferson's seventh generation. What does yours look like? What is your legacy? Look at his tombstone. He only recorded three things on it. It said Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of American Independence, okay. author of the, of the Statute of Virginia for Religious Freedom, which became the Bill of Rights, not bad. Father of the University of Virginia, okay. Anything missing? Can you imagine being President of the United States twice? And it's not important enough to put on your tombstone? He was recording his legacies, not his activities. And when he and Madison were trying to determine how to finance the federal government, they decided the bond should have the term of one generation. His logic was this. He said, the earth belongs to the living. No man may by natural right oblige the lands he owns or occupies to debts greater than those who may be paid during his own lifetime. Because if he could, the world would belong to the dead and not to the living. Whoa. The world would belong to the dead. So, is our goal to be less unsafe, less unjust, less dirty? No, our goal is a delightfully diverse, safe, healthy, and just world with clean air, soil, water, and power, economically, equitably, ecologically, and elegantly enjoyed, period. Does anybody have a problem with this? And so let's take this thing we don't want, let's get rid of it. Let's take the things we do want, let's increase them. Let's inventory what we're doing. Let's decide with intellectual filters what we decide is good and what we decide is bad. Let's start moving on this. And let's just take out the stuff we don't want and take in the stuff we do and grow it. Let's move from just reduce, reuse, recycle, which is obviously worthy, and add to it, redesign, renew, and regenerate so that we can have the difference between currency and capital. We can have both. Currency betrays its own time. It is current. It is ephemeral. It is here today and gone tomorrow. That is currency. This is short-term thinking. What is capital? It is the accrual of capital. Think about an apple. That is currency. You eat it, and it is gone. Think about an orchard. That is capital. It returns currency every year. It is fecund. And we start to realize what that is, is a different kind of model for us to think about, even on an economic platform. And why, you know, I get to be the chair of the World Economic Forum when I'm not an economist, and I talk to some people, and they said, well, you know, the reason is because you're a practitioner. So you think about it, there are some economists who say that economists are people who try to prove that something that's happening in practice can work in theory. So why don't we just Get the people who are doing the work and talk to them. So here you are. That's why I'm here. But what we realize is if we're going to grow our economy, let's do it with currency. What is current? Solar energy is currency. Carbon in, that's black under the ground is ancient solar. It is not currency. It is capital. And we can use it for wonderful benefits to society, including polymers and things like that. But my goodness, return it to the atmosphere as a toxin? How many of us would put up with lead in, a riv in the rivers now? Well, when do we just stop and go, wait a minute, carbon in the atmosphere? It's just the same kind of question. Future generations will say, what were you thinking or not when you were letting this go on? Really? So solar income, living soil, CO2 from the atmosphere. And let's create recurrency, recurrency, recapitalization over and over again. And what happens is we have tools now. We have beautiful tools. We have tools that can track the flow of materials 
through their uses, as we heard from Cisco, as we heard from, uh, hear from lots of different people who do measurement, but also we see new systems like TradeShift coming along where there's this transparent tracking of things, and they'll have not just a quantification of how much stuff is going from here to there, and a way to share that among ourselves so that we can start to track how we're all doing together, because we're not here to compete, frankly. That question of, uh, we had our uh, last moderator, was most excellent. Uh, the question of competition is really interesting. Because uh, how many of you know where the, the roots of the word competition? It comes from the Latin com patare. Com means together. Patare means walk. This means go forward together. Knock, knock. And what it comes from is the Greeks, when they realized they were killing each other with their city-states constantly at war, and all of a sudden they said, you know, we're going to kill each other off and the Persians are going to take us out. So what if we create the Olympics so we can all throw stuff whack at things, get stronger, run around tracks, do all this kind of cool stuff, somebody gets the laurel wreath, but nobody dies. And when the Persians show up, we're fit, see? It means get fit together. That's what this means. And we're gonna now have systems for tracking. We can share this information with each other. How are we doing? How are we doing? We do it together. And it changes the question of business itself. That is what's going on in this room. And we're changing, that's why we're the Chamber of Commerce, that's why I'm here. We're gonna change the question of commerce itself from how much can I get for how little I give? That is the question of modern business. It's a world of greed and it's a world of limits. There's not enough to go around and we get mine as soon as I can, okay? I remember having the chairman of Morgan Stanley in my house at the university. And I said, sir, what do you know from Wall Street that we don't know because we're not? He said, I don't know what you're asking. I said, what's the secret of Wall Street? He said, that's very simple. It's the creation of the perception of scarcity where none exists. Ah, so what does that tell us? Let's change the question. How about how much can we give for all that we get? What if we lived in a world of generosity and abundance? Dr. Ven Kataswamy of Madara, India, was an eye surgeon. It was $1,900 to give cataract surgery. He said, this is crazy. I need a scalpel, a cubic meter of sterility, one nurse, and two lenses. Why are they $220 each? Why is it $1,900 to have your eyesight back? What if I use mass production? There are people here in mass production, right? Len isn't making you a bottle of soap one at a time, promise. So he decided to do that, because then he could have factories making lenses. And if he needed enough of them, then he could afford to do this. So he decided to give it away for free for those who had nothing and couldn't see. And for those who could afford anything, they would pay the price to have the hospitals that went to scale to give them eyesight. And the odds were it would be less than $1,900. You know what happened? When he died some years ago, he had given eyesight to three million people for free. And if you could afford anything, all you had to do to pay the seven hospitals going was 50 bucks. Three million people for free. So we're using that business model now. We're designing something what I announced on Earth Day where we're making shades for the children in Mexico. Solar power, batteries, the history of these things, the materials reuse, and we're gonna be doing them, and we're gonna be giving them to hundreds of thousands of children so they can make their own shelters and learn about renewable power, and we'll take this to scale, because we can. Why? Because it's time. Cradle to cradle design and innovation for the circular economy. Thank you. That was amazing, Bill. Thank you for that. Jennifer? You might want to take questions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to do it right now. Um, so I want to take some very quick questions so, uh, before we run off into uh, the night for our drinks. And I want to do that in a super lightning round. And the way I want to do this, where's my mic runner? Do I got a mic runner? There's a mic runner right there. So I want to do three questions. I'm going to get three questions from the audience here in Twitter style. So think about your, twi your, your question in 140 characters. Um, my friend here is going to run the microphone to you. I'm going to do one, two, three, and then we're going to get them to Bill. Okay? Who's first? 
Throw your hand. There you go. Right there to Matt Swibel. Is go there ahead, such Matt. a thing as a Twitter answer? Yeah. <laughs> go ahead. Up to three U.S. federally elected officials who get it. Okay. So we want to know three federally, three elected federal officials that get it. Next question. There you go. Right there. How do we get cradle to cradle to scale? Cradle to cradle to scale, and right behind you, right behind you. The number one way we can implement the circular economy right here in DC. So we want three US federally elected officials that get it, cradle to cradle to scale, and what can we do right here in DC? <laughs> Easy Ooh. stuff. Easy stuff. Easy stuff. Well, three federally, I, I don't know any federally elected officials that, uh, I, I don't do politics, I don't do media because uh, I have to think, so it's hard for me. Because, uh, um, let's see, I would say the people I know, but are there, well, you know one who does know really deeply is John Kerry. Uh, John Kerry is completely aware of this. We've known each other for a very long time. And Teresa Hines was one of my earliest supporters as a young person. Uh, and she came and I designed her offices in Pittsburgh and she supported Cradle to Cradle from the very beginning. So. Uh, John Kerry, I guess he's not an elected official anymore, but he was certainly a senator. Um, and I, I'll come back to that. And then the next one was... Cradle to cradle to scale. Cradle to cradle to scale. It's because I think that because the circular economy is catching fire, and it's the economy, and that's a great driver. We see it across the board. And since the circular economy is based on cradle to cradle, it seems to me, then that it will enable us to be the fulcrum for this kind of work. And I think this is how you change the earth. Archimedes was recently misquoted in my book uh, for having said, give me a lever and a place to stand and I can move the earth. Uh, what's missing is the fulcrum. A lever and a place to stand means you can poke at something, right? Without a thing that does not move, you have no leverage. And you move the earth downhill by poking it and it rolls away, you know? So to lift it up, I think we need something that does not move. And so I think that's how we get cradle to cradle to scale. We make it the fulcrum. And what's really exciting to me is there are companies in this room I've been working with for years, and this is what we do. We, when we talk about these things, these are people who are being driven by values and, and seeking value. And I think that's how it's gonna work. And, and I think that relates to the question in Washington as well. And it's this. We need to come back to the core, in this case, of what it means to be an American, for example. And, and at the University of Virginia, Mr. Jefferson designed the university with the rotunda and the library at the head. Now, as an architect who was the dean at the architecture school there, I can give you the best tour. If you ever come down, you'll never have anything like it. It's a bit odd. But if you look at what he's doing, these are platonic forms. They're sphere, right, and cube, and pediment. Sphere, egg, get over it, it's a symbol, it's real. Then go inside the egg, and what do you find? Two, it's circular plan, right, on the two lower floors. You see oval rooms with an hourglass hall. These are ovaries, get over it, these are symbols. And, and then you go to the dome with the upper illumination, which is the library and the holding of the knowledge with the illumination. Wow. And that's at the head. This is Plato. That's why he called it Academical Village. Plato talked about the search for truth through beauty, the arts, and culture. The search for truth through beauty. Amazing. And then the two arms leading down the lawn is Aristotle. There's these colonnades, like soldiers, and there are 10 pavilions, five on each side. I lived in one of them, the coolest one. Um, and this is decimal. This is number. This is science. And any engineer or scientist will tell you, and God we trust, all others bring data, right? So somewhere, we realize that's looking for truth in number. And science, it's all the search for truth. But look what he does. He starts with Plato. It's the search for truth in beauty, and then we search for truth in number. And the bottom end was left open to the Blue Ridge Mountains. It was filled in by the Victorians. I guess that's apocryphal. But this idea that you'd have the arts 
and you would have the sciences, and you would have nature. And all I know as a designer, I have a really tough time finding ugly in nature. You ever gone to a beach with a kid? They'll pick up seashells and pebbles immediately. Didn't you remember that? You sit there and you collect the ones you like the most. And they're all beautiful. Have you ever seen an ugly pebble on a beach? But go to a quarry. Sorry, Tim. Go to a quarry and watch us crush the rock. And you go, uh, uh, uh. You don't go barefoot in there, I promise. So you, it's really hard to find ugly. And so I think that's really what we have to do in Washington, is we have to say, if we start with number, we can go to tactic, strategy, and goal. And we just benchmark. That's all we can do. If you start with numbers, you can only benchmark. I'll be less bad, whatever. If you start with your values, you can go to principles, you go to visions, and you understand that visions without execution are hallucination, and then you go to goals, and then you go to strategies, and then you go to tactics, and then you produce value, as we've all heard today. This is an immensely valuable thing we do. There's no question about that. It produces economic benefit, astonishing. Of course it does. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be in business. But we start with our values and we drive it to the value instead of the other way around. Because if you have guardian and commerce and you get the two together, you get corruption. The guardian's job is to keep us safe. If you put commerce into the guardian, you corrupt it, right? That's why we want campaign finance reform. And if you put guardian into commerce, like with the regulation, you slow it down. So let commerce design things that don't need to be regulated because society is not afraid of us, because our values are intact. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you again. So my friends, it's time to go and network and drink uh, some nice, sustainable wines and beers. Um, I just, Bill, I have to just tell you, first of all, I also was born in Japan, so it's, it's, there's a, a great circularity to the way I think people uh, who have experienced what it's like to live in a society like that bring to this world. So thank you again. My takeaways from what you said there, toxin is a material in the wrong place. The Guardian keeps us safe, commerce keeps us free, and competition lets us get fit together a truly amazing way for us to go and have drinks now. We'll see you back here tomorrow at 8.30 a.m. for our, 8 o'clock for our networking breakfast, 8.30 start. Uh, go and have a drink. One more hand of, a round of applause for an amazing job from Mr. Bill McDonough. Thank you.